been an interesting year, right? So no matter how you feel about things, this year has been an interesting year, 2020. Last week, I was looking at some of the news articles out there. Uh, December 12th, I came across a CNN news article that read, Jeffrey Michael Keene was a devoted husband, father, and an Army combat veteran. He had served four tours in Afghanistan and Iraq during his 12 years of service. Despite being in the front lines of war, he would face his deadliest challenge at home. Scott and I have been in the military. We know how things can get pretty bad quickly there. And, and, and Paul, thank you, Paul. <laughs> in the years since leaving the military, he and his wife, Nicole, welcomed their first child, Adeline, and moved to Lexington, Kentucky from Texas. He found a job as a service specialist at the local car dealership, making him the sole breadwinner. The Keens were expecting their second child, a boy, in December. Instead, the baby was born prematurely on October 26th. But Michael, 39, would never know. Struggling with COVID-19 symptoms, he died two days later in the same hospital where his son was receiving emergency care. The joy and sorrow of those traumatic days tested Nicole Keene's faith. I don't know why he answered my prayers for Wesson, the baby boy, and not for Michael, my husband, she told CNN. It makes me very angry, but I keep praying because he gave me a miracle. Sadly, this has become an all too familiar story. We hear this all the time. Typically, when we get these types of news reports, we sometimes feel a connection to the story because we feel a sense of collective grief, a sense of grief for the family that has been devastated by this terrible disease. Other times though, because of how often we hear these types of stories, we feel a little bit far removed from it. It's difficult to distinguish between one report and another. Whichever camp you find yourselves in, whichever camp you find we find ourselves in, one thing is for certain, a lot of people all around us are in pain, we ourselves are in pain. The pain is not always physical. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's even spiritual. Regardless of the type of pain you feel, the common thread is that people in severe pain are desperate for relief. In our desperation, we tend to seek relief in other people, be it our friends, our family, our pastor, our doctor, or even our politicians. Sometimes in the absence of pain relief from others, we seek a way to distract ourselves from the pain with our jobs, our houses, our cars, our electronics, or any of the other idols that demand an inordinate amount of our attention. When people and idols fail, we sometimes turn to substances that we believe will help numb our pain or our senses to the pain. Drugs, alcohol, or even food. Finally, in the pits of our sorrow, when we realize that the pain we feel is still as strong as it ever was, we then turn to the one person we should have turned to in the first place. The wonderful thing about our God is that he doesn't hold this against us. When we do finally turn to him, God often has unconventional ways to relieve our pain and in the process teach us a little something about ourselves and about him. Today, we are going to learn a few lessons from the life of a very well-known man, a man who was also in pain and in desperate need of relief. This man is Naaman. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you. We come to you this morning. We are in pain, as you very well know. We seek relief in things around us. But Father in heaven, we know that the only true pain relief that's available to all of us is you. I pray, Father in heaven, that we open up our hearts to allow the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts to teach us a few lessons 
about how we should seek the relief that we so desperately need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If he were an American military officer, we would refer to Naaman as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was a top military leader in one of the region's most powerful nations, Aram. He was a definite candidate for Time Magazine's Person of the Year. He was a cream of the crop. He lived among the upper crust and mingled with the elite. Naaman seemed to have everything, but he was in pain. Naaman is first introduced to us in the book of 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. And he says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. I hope you caught those descriptors, right? Commander. Great, highly regarded, victorious, valiant. Here was a man that had power, position, and prestige. He was successful. He was a winner. He was wealthy. He was a hero. He was respected. He was admired. He was envied. But, notice how that word always seems to change everything. You could be talking to someone and say all kinds of wonderful things to them. However, as soon as you say the word, but, it seems you might as well not have said anything at all. Everything you said before the but just fades away. Lee's not here right now, but I was going to tease her. Lee's food is great, but. Paul is a great student. But Scott's sermon was great, but, right? We don't care what was said before that. All we care about once we hear but is that what comes is what comes after it. Our ears perk up, our heart beats a little bit faster. Nothing else in the world seems to matter. We wait in anticipation. But what? Right? Once we hear that, that's all we care about at that point in time. Naaman was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Naaman could think about all of his accomplishments. He could enjoy his power and position and prestige. He could admire his home and his wealth, but they all seemed to vanish as he stared in the mirror every single day. Each time he looked at himself, there was something, looking back, that defined his life. He was a leper, and nothing could change that fact. Nothing. You see, in those days, leprosy was like how people saw HIV or AIDS in the 80s and 90s here. right? Lepers were isolated and humiliated. They were outcasts. They were forced to wear torn clothing and shout, unclean, unclean, anytime they encountered an uninfected person. Imagine doing that today. People with COVID, got to walk around, unclean, unclean. Imagine that. That's what it was. So how terrible that would be, right? It was extremely contagious, just like COVID, and in many cases, incurable. In its worst forms, leprosy led to death. Naaman knew that this disease was only going to get worse and eventually take his life. While his prior accomplishments afforded him some level of respect and admiration, admiration from his countrymen, eventually nobody would touch him. Eventually, everyone would avoid him. Eventually, he would become an outcast. Imagine how he felt. He must have sat for hours on end, contemplating his future, wondering how he got here. And as we humans often do, he probably put on a brave face at first. I feel like nothing was going on. 
trying to conceal his disease from those around him. He did his best to hide his pain. Brothers and sisters, like Naaman, what problems are you and I trying to conceal? What hurt are we trying to cover up? We, like Naaman, have become rather good at trying to cover up our problems. The key word here, though, is trying because just like leprosy, eventually the word will get out. Our problems will spread and become so painful that we have no choice but to cry out for help. So what do we do when we find ourselves in these kinds of situations? Where do we find help? Where do we go for healing? Do we turn to substances? Do we turn to other people? Where can we find relief? That is the question. Let us see what Naaman does. In verses 2 and 3, it says, 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Let's stop and imagine a little bit what was going through Naaman's mind, right, when he heard this recommendation. Israel was a conquered nation. To Naaman, it was a second-rate, third-world country. What could Israel have to offer him? To make matters worse, a slave girl from this third-world country was giving him Medical advice. Seriously? There's more. Not only did she want him to go to Israel, where did she want him to go? Samaria. Samaria? So if Israel was a second-rate, third-world country, Samaria would have been the armpit of the second-rate, third-world country. Samaria was despised even by Israelites. This is where she wanted him to go. What is the lesson here, though? When we are at our most desperate, God sends us relief in the most unexpected ways. Sometimes the people we least expect are the ones that God sends our way. Quite often, the problem really is us. We have to get over ourselves in order to receive God's healing. We have to humble ourselves in order to see what God has in store for us. Naaman had to get over himself in order to receive God's healing. A lowly little slave girl was telling Naaman of Aram, Naaman the brave, Naaman the victorious, Naaman the valiant, to go see some prophet in the slums of Israel. So we can only speculate what was going through Naaman's mind. But the one thing we do know is what he does next. Verses 4 to 9. So Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Amen, indeed. So what is the lesson here? 
throughout scripture, the nation of Israel is used as a metaphor, a metaphor for the church. The church is supposed to be a safe place. The church is supposed to be a place of healing, a place that gives a caring touch in an uncaring world, a place that provides sanctuary, protection, and comfort for those that would seek to assault, a place that extends a supportive hand to those in trouble. That is what the church is supposed to be. But a church is more than these things as well. A church is most of all a place where we come to commune with our God. Oftentimes we come to church and end up missing the point. Notice that when Naaman first entered Israel, he was in the right place, but speaking to the wrong person. He first went to the king of Israel, but the king could not help him. In fact, the king misunderstood his coming altogether and thought Naaman was trying to pick a fight. How many of us come to church every Sabbath to hang out with our friends, enjoy the music and the food, but leave not having communed with the person we came to see in the first place? How many of us are focused on how others in the church treat us while failing to recognize how much Christ loves you and I and how much he sacrificed for you? How many of us come to church to impress our friends with our knowledge of the Bible and fail to receive the revival of the Holy Spirit? I don't know about you, but I for one am guilty as charged. Naaman was at the right place, but speaking to the wrong person. Naaman was at the right place, but doing the wrong thing. The good news is that God was not done with Naaman. God is also not done with you and I either. Verse 9 to 10. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. There's a lot going on here. At first, I didn't notice it. There are several things going on, interesting stuff. Remember that after the lowly slave girl tells the mighty Naaman to go to a prophet in Samaria, he goes to his king to get permission, first of all, right? Because again, he is the top military commander. He leaves for Israel with an official letter, a bunch of money, and an entourage. This was an official state visit. Think about it. The top military commander with a letter from the king and this on gifts and money and an entourage and a letter. It says in verse 9, that Naaman arrived at Elisha's house with his horses and chariots. Imagine the impressive sights that would have been. If it was today, it would be a presidential motorcade with sirens and all this stuff winding through the streets, arriving at an apartment in the ghetto. That really was what it was. Imagine, can you imagine that concept? I remember a few years ago, I was in Philadelphia at a conference. First time in Philadelphia, I came out, I was tired all day long, talk, talk, talk. I was like, man, I need, I need a break from this. I left. Interesting, I left, I walked out, and I saw a bunch of cops everywhere. I was like, oh, hey, what's going on here? I mean, I, I've never been to Philadelphia before, but I mean, sometimes I hear that there may be some interesting things going on. I was like, okay, I don't know, let me just watch and be careful. I had no idea that Obama was in Philadelphia that day. It's my first time ever seeing a presidential motorcade. Cops everywhere. And I see these trucks and cars flying through with guys with guns everywhere, everything loaded and ready to go. I was like, what is going on? I still had no idea what was going on. It was a sight to behold. Never seen it before. Never knew what it looked like. I seen it on TV, but in real life, it's very loud. A lot of movement everywhere. Imagine that whole scenario, winding down the streets to some apartment complex in the ghetto. That's exactly what happened here. 
But the funny thing about this is, is that with all this pomp and circumstance, what happens next? Elisha sends a messenger to tell Naaman to go do what? Take a bath. I know, exactly. I'm getting to that, right? <laughs> Elisha doesn't even come out and say, what's going on? What's, what's all this noise and rac ruckus out here? No, 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 no. He doesn't show his face. Elisha never shows up. He sends a messenger. He doesn't welcome him into his home and say, have a seat. I'm going to make you something to eat. He doesn't even talk to him directly. Instead, he sends a messenger and tells him to go dip himself, as Scott said, in some dirty water, not once, not twice, but seven times. Seven times. Seven times, right? Seven times. I'm trying to count over here. Seven times. Dip in some dirty water seven times. How low can a brother go? Come on, people. <laughs> what Naaman does, <laughs> it's, I don't blame him. Verse 11 to 12, he says, But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? How he knows this, I have no idea. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in rage. Again, I fully understand. I can imagine him just thinking to himself, is, is, this, is, this, is this guy for real? Does, does he know who I am? Does he realize how far I've traveled to get here? He didn't even afford me the, court, the courtesy of coming to the door himself. He sent a messenger. And can you imagine the advice he gave me? His medical advice to me is to go take a bath. A bath? If a bath was all I needed, I could have done that in my own country. There are plenty of rivers in my country. Doesn't he know that we have some of the nicest beaches and rivers in the region? Rivers that are befitting a man of my stature. You see, Naaman was a big shot in his country, and he wanted a big shot prophet to meet him at the door and heal him. Not only did he want this prophet to meet him, he wanted the prophet to jump up and shout and dance and put on a big show for his healing to occur. <laughs> That's not how God works, right? God does not always send blessings in the people we want and in the vehicle we want. Oftentimes, God chooses lowly persons through ordinary means to accomplish his healing. You see, Naaman was part of the pastor-only crowd. The crowd that believes that it cannot be ministered to if the pastor doesn't do the ministering. The crowd that believes they can't be prayed for if the pastor doesn't do the praying. The crowd that believes that they cannot be preached to if the pastor doesn't do the preaching or visited if the pastor doesn't do the visiting. We have to be very careful if we find ourselves in the pastor-only crowd or even the big shot-only crowd. We run the risk of totally missing God's healing because we are so busy looking for someone or something other than what God has for us. Quite often we receive the touch of God, but because it was not spectacular enough for us, we chuck it up to coincidence or to luck, or worse off, we just dismiss it. I want you all today to ask yourselves, me included, what is God doing in your life today that you are overlooking or not thinking about, and you're not thanking him for? What are you simply ignoring because it was not packaged the way you were expecting it? What gifts are you rejecting because it was not delivered by your favorite UPS guy? 
Let's get back to Naaman. What he does next, of all we know about him, what he does next is actually quite remarkable. In 13 to 14, he says, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, great, some, some great thing, sorry, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a child. Again, another servant. Whatever Naaman's flaws are, whatever we think of him, one thing we do notice with him is his ability to listen to his servants. This is remarkable. Think about who he is. He could have easily dismissed the servant girl. He could have easily dismissed Elisha's servant, which he kind of did. He could have easily dismissed this servant. Even in his pride, we see Naaman humble himself enough to listen to a servant. We can speculate and say, okay, well, maybe because he was just desperate. Or we can see this as a testament to the fact that he was willing to go down to where God wanted him to go. Either way, what we do know is that Naaman obeyed. He obviously had doubts the entire time. But he did it anyway. See, God doesn't always expect that our faith will be rock solid every single time. He doesn't expect us to always agree with his will. What he wants, though, is for us to believe that his way is better than ours. We may not always understand his way of working, but we must humbly obey in order to receive his blessings. He wants us to trust him. Naaman was told to dip in the dirty Jordan River seven times. Today, God is asking you, is asking me, to dip seven times in the Jordan River as well. He's asking you to step into the muck, into something that may not look appealing from the outside. He's saying, trust me. I want you fully immersed in there. This is where your healing is. Think about it. What is it in your life? that God is leading you towards that is not appealing to you. That is what he's calling you to. Get in there. Get in the muck. This is where your healing is. When God asks for seven times, do not try to get by with only five or even six. Seven means seven. I keep trying to do this, but I, I don't want to keep embarrassing myself. God wants us to go the distance. The conditions are not the source of the healing. The conditions are a test of our obedience. Seven means seven. If you think about the life of Naaman, there's so many contrasts in his journey. The commander-in-chief finds direction through a captive servant, his wife's slave. Naaman, the conqueror, finds help in a conquered nation, Israel. Naaman, the highly regarded man, learns of his treatment from a lowly messenger, Elisha's messenger. Naaman, the wealthy and valiant soldier, is cured in a dirty river, the Jordan. And as we know in verse 15, he says, Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. That was a changed man. Naaman went from a sick man to a healed man. An, un an ungodly man to a godly man. A lost man to a saved man. A great man to a gracious man. 
and from a commander of men to a servant of God. Here was a man who through humility had experienced God's healing touch and he was forever changed. It takes humility to share our pain, our shortcomings with others. It takes humility to ask for help. It takes humility to see that God sometimes sends us the person we least expect to help. It takes humility to see how God is working in our lives in unexpected ways. It takes humility to obey even when it goes contrary to everything we think we know. Brothers and sisters, it takes humility. In the midst of whatever you are going through, in the midst of your challenges, as we leave here today, my sincere prayer is that each and every one of us, like Naaman, humble ourselves in the mighty hand of God so we may receive the relief that he so freely offers us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, as we close this service, we ask for your presence in our lives. Help us to put down our pride and come down to the water and wash and be cleaned. Father, you only ask from us for simple things. And we turn mountains into molehills and molehills into mountains. Help us to see what you truly have for us. Be with us as we go through this week and protect your servants. In your name I pray, amen.